My grandfather was a pastor, an elder they called them, in the Church of God in Christ, a Pentecostal denomination. He had the same name as my father, Abnis Reed, so they called my father AJ for Abnis Jr. My grandmother Ruby was a deaconess in the same church. My father came from a strict religious household, but sanctified churches are rooted in African traditions, so music, especially drumming, even if it's only drumming by clapping your hands together, played a big part of the service. Worship is never a quiet thing in the Church of God in Christ congregation. People passing out, speaking in tongues, or tarrying for hours until they become possessed with the Holy Ghost, and the church mothers dressed in nurse uniforms come and revive them. My father's parents were strict. Secular music, like the Motown sound, was forbidden in AJ's house, but he snuck and listened anyway. The whole family had to be in church all the time, like four or five days a week. His three sisters couldn't wear makeup or pants, and his two brothers spent most of the week in church, too. Church wasn't a major part of my life growing up, as it had been for my father. Soul in your house usually referred to the music. But when you grew, when you grow up in a place like Bed-Stuy, church is everywhere. So is mosque. So are a thousand other ways of believing. Street corners were where all these different beliefs met. Pentecostals arguing scriptures with Jehovah's Witnesses. Clean-cut brothers in bow ties and dark suit brushing past cats wearing fezzes and long beards. Someone with a bullhorn or a mic and an amplifier booming out a sermon. We were all just living life, trying to get through, survive, thrive, whatever. But in the back of our minds, there was always a larger plan that we tried to make sense of. I was always fascinated by religion and curious about people's different ideas. And like everyone, I've always wanted answers to the basic questions. Still, by the time I reached my teens, the only time I'd be anywhere near a church was when someone I knew died. And even then, I wouldn't necessarily go in. But I wasn't looking for a church anyway. I was looking for an explanation. You ain't got to go to church to get to know your God. I think for some people, life is always like those street corners in Brooklyn with everyone arguing for the superiority of their own beliefs. I believe that religion is the thing that separates and controls people. I don't believe in the fire and brimstone shit, the idea that God will punish people for eternity in a burning hell. I believe in one God. That's the thing that makes the most sense to me. There's wisdom in all kinds of religious traditions. I'll take from Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Buddhism, whatever. The parts that make the most sense feel like they're coming from the same voice, the same God. Most of all, I don't think what I believe should matter to anyone else. I'm not trying to stop anyone from believing whatever they want. I believe in God, and that's really enough for me. I don't spend a lot of time on records talking about my talking about spiritual ideas in an explicit way. Although I think a lot of my music sneaks in those big questions of good and evil, fate and destiny suffering, and inequality. I think about life mostly in pragmatic terms. I think about behavior and intention in the here and now, but I also think about karma. It's a complicated idea that I've tried to make sense of. At the heart of a lot of these competing ideas of the afterlife and heaven and hell and thug angels and all that is the idea that if the universe is just, is just, Things have to even out eventually, somehow. And sometimes, that's a scary thought. I've done things I know are wrong. There are times when I feel like I've suffered for those things, that I've paid back for my mistakes in spades. But then there are times when I look around me at the life I have today and think I'm getting away with murder. It's something a lot of us who come from hard places go through. And maybe we feel a certain amount of survivor's guilt for it, I never imagined I'd be where I am today. There's a line in Fade to Black, the concert film we did for the Black album, where I say, I sometimes step back and see myself from the outside and say, who is that guy? Over time, I've worked to get more clarity about my past and present and to unify my outside shell and soul, but it's ongoing. Inside, there's still part of me that expects to wake up tomorrow in my bedroom in apartment 5C in Marcy, slide on my gear, 
run down the pissy stairways, and hit the block, one eye over my shoulder. Sensitive thugs, y'all all need hugs. Sometimes this uneasiness comes out in my songwriting. I was on vacation when I started writing Beach Chair. This was after my semi-retirement with the Black Album, and I was really trying to sit back for the first time in my life and get off the grind for a minute. My vacation of choice, even back before I got into music, has always involved water and warmth. I wanted to write a song that matched my mood, a song about the good life, but almost immediately, the song went left. It begins with the line, life is but a dream to me, but turns into a meditation on ambition and the laws of the universe, on questions I can still only ask, but not fully answer. It's a song that I think of as one of the hidden jewels in my catalog. Some people absolutely love the song, but other people find it confusing and out of character. But just as I tried to do something a little different on my first album, get deep inside the conflicted mind of a hustler, I'm still trying to push hip-hop into new places. In the song Regrets, off my first album, there's a line addressed to my mother. You used to hold me, tell me that I was the best. That can almost be taken as soft. But what niggas are supposed to niggas are supposed to be so hard that their mothers never held them? It's kind of ridiculous. In Streets is talking off the Dynasty album, in the middle of a pretty hardcore song, I threw out a line about my father leaving me. I ain't mad at your dad, holla at your lad. Which might seem odd, because I shouldn't I just be saying, fuck you, dad, I hope you die? instead of open my, opening myself up to be played by the man who abandoned me. But that feeling was real. I couldn't deny it. Honest introspection has always been one of the tools I use in my rhymes. Songs like Beach Chair are just an evolution of that same technique applied to broader questions, the kind of questions that even the grimiest street cat wakes up wondering about at three in the morning. I think for hip hop to grow, to its potential and stay relevant for another generation, we have to keep pushing deeper and deeper into the biggest subjects and doing it with real honesty. The truth is always relevant. When I made my first album, it was my intention to make it my last. I threw everything I had into reasonable doubt, but then the plan was to move into the corner office and run our label. I didn't do that, so instead of being a definitive statement that would end with the sound of me dropping the mic forever, it was just the beginning of something. That something was the creation of the character Jay-Z. Rappers refer to, them, refer to themselves a lot. What the rapper is doing is creating a character that if you're lucky, you find out about more and more from song to song. The rapper's character is essentially a conceit, a first person literary creation. The core of that character has to match the core of the rapper himself. But then that core gets amplified by the rapper's creativity and imagination. You can be anybody in the booth. It's like wearing a mask. It's an amazing freedom, but also a temptation. The temptation is to go too far, to pretend the mask is real, and try to convince people that you're something that you're not. The best rappers use their imaginations to take their own core stories and emotions and feed them to characters who can be even more dramatic or epic or provocative. And whether it's in a movie or a television show or whatever, the best characters get inside of us. We care about them. We love them or hate them. And we start to see ourselves in them. In a crazy way, become them. Scarface the movie did more than Scarface the rapper to me. In hip hop, there's practically a cult built up around the 1983 remake of Scarface, the one starring Al Pacino. Lines from that movie are scattered all over hip-hop, including my own song. All I got is my balls and my word. The world is yours. I always tell the truth even when I lie. Don't get high on your own supply. You fuck with me, you're fucking with the best. Say goodnight to the bad guy. Okay, I'm reloaded. You gotta get the money first. When you get the money, you get the power. When you get the power, you get the woman. Who do I trust? Me, that's who. And of course, say hello to my little friend. So many people saw their story in that movie. No one literally looked in the mirror and saw Tony Montana staring back at them. I hope. But there are people who feel Tony's emotions 
as if they were their own. Feel the words he speaks like they're coming out of their own mouth. I've always found this a little strange because I hope I'm not giving anything away here. At the end of the movie, Tony gets shot. He's wasted. His life is in ruins. His family is destroyed. It's funny that so many people use the phrase, the world is yours, as a statement of triumph. When in the movie, the last time the words occur, they're underneath Tony's bloody body in a fountain. But that's not what people identify with. It seems like the movie ends in some people's memory about two-thirds of the way through, before it all goes to shit for Tony. And for those two-thirds of the movie, they are Tony. And after the movie, Tony is still alive in them as an inspiration. And maybe a cautionary tale, too. Like, yeah, I'll be like Tony, but not make the same mistakes. The viewer inhabits the character while the movie runs. But when it's over, the character lives in lives on in the viewer. So instead of passing judgment on Tony, you make a complete empathetic connection to the good and bad in him. You feel a sense of ownership over his character and behavior. That's how it works with great characters. How you rate music that thugs with no with nothing relate to it. People connect the same way to the character Jay-Z. Like I said, rappers refer to themselves a lot in their music but it's not strictly because rappers are immodest. Part of it is about boasting. That's a big part of what rap is traditionally about. But a lot of the self-reference has nothing to do with bragging or boasting. Rappers are just crafting a character that the listener can relate to. Not every rapper bothers with creating a big first-person character. Chuck D, a great MC, never really makes himself into a larger-than-life character because his focus is on analyzing the larger world from an almost objective argumentative point of view, even when he's speaking in a first-person voice. You really become Chuck D when you're listening to Public Enemy. It's more like watching a really, really lively speech. On the other hand, if you have MCs like DMX, for whom everything comes from a subjective personal place, when he growls out a line like, on parole with warrants, that'll send me back the raw way. The person rapping along to it in their car is completely living the lyric, like it's happening to them. They relate. When Lauren Hill came out with the miseducation of Lauren Hill, for a while, it was the only thing I listened to. Lauren is a very different person from me, of course, but I felt her lyrics like they were mine. She was also one of the few contemporary female MCs I could even rap along to in my car. I love Little Kim but I'd be a little nervous pulling up to a light and having someone see me rapping along to Queen Bitch. Lauren's lyrics transcended the specifics of gender and personal biography, which is why she connected to so many people with that album. All kinds of people could find themselves in those songs and in the character she created. My corporate thugs be like, yeah, Jigga, talk that shit. There's a funny Dave Ch Chappelle bit, one of his When Keeping It Real Goes Wrong sketches. Chappelle plays a young black guy named Vernon who works as a vice president at a major corporation. At the end of a meeting, a bald white colleague tells him, Vernon, you the man, and the Chappelle character snaps. He stands up and gets in a dude's face. Allow me to reintroduce myself. My name is Ho. He ends up working at a gas station. It's funny, but the truth is, I do hear about guys in corporate offices who psych themselves up listening to my music, which sounds odd at first, but makes sense. My friend Steve Stout, who spends a lot of time in the corporate world, tells me about young execs he knows who say they discovered their own philosophies of business and life in my lyrics. It's crazy, but when people hear me telling my stories or boasting in my songs or whatever, they don't hear some rapper telling them how much better than them he is. They hear it as their own voice. It taps into the part of them that needs every now and then to say, fuck it, allow me to reintroduce myself, nigga. And when I'm really talking shit, like in this piece from the song Threats off the Black Album, put that knife in ya, take a little bit of life from ya. Am I frightening ya? Shall I continue? I put the gun to ya, I let, the sing you a, I let it sing you a song. I let it hum to ya, the other ones sing along. Now it's a duet, and you wet, when you check out. The technique from the two texts, and I don't need two lips to blow this like a trumpet, you dumb shit. 
I don't think any listeners think I'm threatening them. I think they're singing along with me, threatening someone else. They're thinking, yeah, I'm coming for you. And they might apply it to anything, to taking their next math test or straightening out that chick talking out of pocket in the next cubicle. When it seems like I'm bragging or threatening or whatever, what I'm actually trying to do is to embody a certain spirit, give voice to a certain emotion. I'm giving the listener a way to articulate that emotion in their own lives, however it applies. Even when I do a song that feels like a complete autobiography, like December 4th, I'm still trying to speak to something that everyone can find in themselves. I'll tell you half the story, the rest you fill it in. Of course, Reasonable Doubt wasn't my only album, but as I was moving into my early 30s, I wanted to change myself in new ways. I was looking forward to building a label from the ground up, starting from scratch. Rockefeller's deal with Def Jam was set to expire, and I saw it as the perfect time to move on. When I announced plans to begin recording the Black album, I said it would be my last for at least two years, and that story grew into rumors about retirement. I considered an all-out retirement out loud to the media, and that was a mistake, even though I definitely gave the idea a lot of space in my head. When I first started planning the Black album, it was a concept album. I wanted to do that Prince... I wanted to do what Prince had done, release an album of my most personal autobiographical tracks with absolutely no promotion, no cover art, no magazine ads, no commercials, nothing. One day the album would just appear on the shelves and the buzz would build organically. Like my dream of Reasonable, Reasonable Doubt being my only album, that idea quickly evaporated, but I stuck to the idea of making the album more explicitly autobiographical autobiographical than anything I'd done before. December 4th, the song that opens the album, is itself a capsule autobiography. I took my mother out for her birthday, and on the way to the restaurant, I made her take a detour to Baseline and tell some stories about my life. These were the stories that were already legend in my family. I'd heard them a million times. My painless teen, my painless 10-pound birth, how I learned to ride a bike at a young age, the time she bought me a boombox because I loved rapping so much. The thing I love about these stories is, is that they're unique to me, of course, but they're also the sort of minor mythologies that every family has, the kind of stories that everyone hears from their parents and aunts and uncles if they're lucky enough to have parents around. In the song I played that near universal mother love against the content of the verses, which was a story about how I went from a kid whose world was torn apart by his father's leaving to a young hustler in the streets who excelled but was scarred by the life and eventually decided to try this rap shit for a living. The parts where my mother's voice comes in and the song into the song are surrounded by swirling orchestral fanfare that make the little stories feel epic. And that's how it feels for everyone, I think. To hear our mothers proudly tell those little stories about what made us special over and over again. My final show for the Black Album Tour was at the Garden. Playing Madison Square Garden by myself had been a fantasy of mine since I was a kid watching Knicks games with my father and Marcy. I arrived and the sight of my name and lights on the marquee got me in the right frame of mind. I began to visualize the whole show from beginning to end. In my mind, it was flawless. Security at the garden was nuts. My own bodyguard couldn't even get in. Backstage, I watched my peers come in one by one. Puff was there in a chinchilla. Foxy showed up wearing leather shorts. Slick Rick was there wearing his truck jewelry. Ghostface had on his bathrobe. I had asked Amir and the Roots Band to join me for the, for the few shows I did before the garden so we could get the show in pocket. And that night, he was extra nervous, but I told him to act like it's any other show. We both knew that was a lie. Michael Buffer, who announces all the boxing matches in the garden, announced me, and I did my signature ad libs. The crowd went bananas. I started my set off with, what more can I say? And I ended the night with December 4th, the song I named for my birthday. I ended this concert by retiring myself sending a giant jersey with my name on it up to the rafters. As it was making its way to the top of the garden, I looked into the crowd and saw a girl in the audience crying, 
real tears streaming down her face. It was all I could do to stop looking at her and focus on one person next to her, on, on the person next to her. My songs are my stories, but they take on their own life in the minds of people listening. The connection that creates is sometimes overwhelming. Epilogue. I was over at L.A. Reed's house in New York for a dinner party a couple of years ago when I first met Oprah Winfrey. I've met a lot of powerful people, but Oprah, as everyone knows, is in her own stratosphere. She also She's also someone who's been vocally skeptical about hip-hop for a long time because of the violence and rawness of a lot of the Im imagery and language, particularly the use of what she called the N-word. This, it's ironic that she's also been a champion of other kinds of writing, from poets like Maya Angelou to novelists like Toni Morrison, that also use violent and raw images and language, including the dreaded N-word, to get at true emotion and experiences. But for her, rap was different and dangerous in a way that other forms of art weren't. Oprah and I ended up talking for a while at that dinner. Somehow it came up that I'd read, that I'd read The Seed of the Soul, a book that really affected the way I think about life. The book is about karma and what it means to do the right thing and the power of intention. It turns out that the author Gary Zukav had been a guest on Oprah's show on m multiple occasions and Oprah expressed surprise that I was also a fan of his work. She, she didn't expect that of a rapper. I could tell that the way she saw me shifted in that moment. I wasn't exactly who she thought I was. Oprah and I have since gone on to become friendly acquaintances after having only observed each only observed each other warily from a distance. But it was a fascinating moment to me. Rap, as I said at the beginning of the book, is at the heart of an art form that gave voice to, the, to a specific experience. But like every art, is ultimately about the most common human experiences joy, pain, fear, desire, uncertainty, hope, anger, love, love of crew, love of family, even romantic love. Put on a miseducation of Lauren Hill sometime and tell me rap can't be romantic. Or if you want to keep it street, put on Mary J. Blige and Method Man. Uh, I'll be there for you. You're all I need to get by. Of course, in the end, it may not be the art form for you, Oprah, for instance, still can't get past the N-word issue for the, or the nigga issue with all apologies to Miss Winfrey. I can respect her position. To her, it's a matter of acknowledging the deep and painful history of the word. To me, it's just a word, a word whose power is owned by the user and his or her intention. People give words power, so banning a word is futile, really. Nigga becomes porch monkey, becomes coon, and so on if that's what in the person's heart. The key is to change the person. And we change people through conversation, not through censorship. That's why I want people to understand what the words we use and the stories we tell are really about. And that's why I wrote this book. I love writing rhymes. There's probably nothing that gives me as much pleasure. There have been times in my life when I've tried to put it to the side when I was a kid so I could focus on hustling in the street. And when I was an adult, so I could focus on hustling in the boardroom. But the words kept coming. They're still coming and will probably never stop. That's my story. But the story of the larger culture is a story of a million MCs all over the world who are looking out of their windows or standing on street corners or riding in their cars through their cities or suburbs or small towns. And inside of them, the words are coming too. The words they need to make sense of the world they see around them. The, the words are witty and blunt, abstract and linear, sober and fucked up. And when we decode that torrent of words, by which I mean really listen to them with our minds and hearts open, we can understand their world better. And ours too. It's the same world. 